Uh, my name is Shane Pearson. Uh, I'm the SVP of product at Leadspace. And we're we'll gonna be talking about a solution that we've built over, uh, well, different parts of the solution that we've built over the last couple of years. But we're gonna focus on the self-service analytics uh, capabilities we've built in the last few months with uh, Sigma. And I've got Neil here. Hey everyone, my name is Neil Coleman. I'm a solution architect with Sigma. Um, Shane's gonna do most of the presenting today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about Sigma because I think some people are probably fairly new to it. Uh, we wanna give you a little bit of background on what Sigma is and who we are. All right, so we're gonna jump right into it and uh, skip past all this stuff. So a little bit about lead space, and we won't spend a whole bunch of time with this, but knowing a little bit about our background will help with some of why we're doing what we're doing, both with Databricks, which I'll talk about some, and then also what we're doing with Sigma. So lead space, we are in a couple different markets. We're about a 14-year-old startup is the way I describe it, and I've been with the company about three years. Uh, the main uh, market that we're in is something called customer data platform. If you're not familiar with it, it's basically a data integration middleware solution where what we do is we integrate, aggregate, and normalize companies' uh, customer data. So that means we connect all their sales and marketing systems, we make all the data look pretty, make it all uh, make sense, and uh, people use that to drive their sales and marketing business processes. So it's uh, something a lot of people have in terms of solutions, and it's one of those things lots of people don't even know about that exists. Uh, in the markets we serve, we work with a lot of larger enterprise companies. We serve about a couple billion profiles a year, and what a profile to us is a, is a company or person record. And so that means uh, we work with a lot of data. And about 80% of the data that we serve has some type of uh, AI component. We used to call this scoring, but now everything's AI. So what AI means for us, or scoring means, is we have different types of models we develop, which is all about how we classify different types of, of objects. So it's things like propensity to purchase, it's things like personas, you know, what does this type of person most likely uh, look like in terms of job function capabilities and interests. Uh, and then we also do things around intent. And so that is what are the topics that you're interested in, what are the actions you are doing, and then things around technology signals. So this is where, what are the technologies and skills that different people or companies have? So those are the different types of scoring uh, that we apply to the customer data that we manage. And we do that with different types of models we develop. And we do that at scale. Uh, we'll typically be working with companies that have anywhere from, uh, on the smaller size, a half million records, to people that have you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of records that we work with. So we do that every day. And where we came to work with Sigma, and this is just an example of, of one of the reports we built with them, is a lot of what we do with these profiles isn't just serve data. We do lots of things in the back end. It's all invisible, uh, and it's automated. And the example I give, if you have a CRM system like Salesforce, like we're working behind it to make sure all that data is correct. And so that's, that's a big part of what we do. If you have a marketing system, we're working behind it to make sure all the data is correct. So it's profile-led, that's all that data part. But then again, what we mentioned is a lot of the, the work we're doing around models and scoring, it's all that, how do we help you understand what are the best customers you have? What are the best prospects to go after because they look like your best customers? And then all the act actions around activating that with the marketing team. And so it's kind of a full life cycle uh, event we do, but it starts with the data's gotta be right. And a lot of what we're doing today, it's how do we visualize data for regular people because a big gap that you know, people have talked about here today, and I think a lot of people in the room is, it's how do, you, how do you make data actionable? So a lot of what we're gonna talk today with self-service apps, that is like what keeps me up at night. Like how do we make our data more helpful to the people who actually understand what the data is about? And that's not the, most of the people in this room that do data, it's the people that we all support. So we'll talk about our data and challenge, and we're gonna use a couple different examples today one that I'm gonna to refer to a lot is intent data, just because of the scale. So has anybody in here worked with intent data? Just to, curious, okay. So intent data is really simple concept. What are people interested in? So we're gonna process any given week two to three billion signals of intent data at Leadspace. Just, it's one of our bigger data sets that we manage. And so that is millions of domains around the world that represent millions of companies 
And also, obviously, all the activity that people have as you're looking for something. And so the simple thing is what is intent. It means you went to a search engine or you did an action on a, on a web page that's enabled with a pixel and you were looking for something. So you might have been looking for uh, Thai food in San Francisco. That is a topic. That's an example of what an intent topic is. And so all of that data is available to be um, used to find different information. And so that's one example of intent and signal data. And the problem we deal with is on the back end, like we have a lot of that working, but how do you surface all that information in a highly scalable application for business people? And that's like something lots of people struggle with. And then you get to the other thing is, besides our app, they want us to embed it in their app. So you've got different issues with distribution that we deal with. So when we started talking to Sigma, we had a few different things that we were really interested in, and, and we'll get into all the details. So the, the first one is, uh, we wanted a solution that we could use both for our customers, but also our internal employees. And this is where the Databricks part comes in. So we are a 100% Databricks shop. Uh, we'll talk more about that. But what we wanted to do was make all this data we have that before was mostly only available if you knew how to code. So you had to be in Databricks, or, or I should say, it was only available at scale if you, need, if you knew how to code. You could go to a developer and they could put something together for you, obviously. Uh, but we wanted the ability to get all of our internal users access to all that data because a lot of times they know best about how our customers want to use it. And so there's this opportunity for us to have better collaboration across what are people that know how the data wants to be used and the people that know how to put the data to work to support them. And that's the whole scalability aspect. On the customer side, we wanted one plane of capability that went from Databricks to our customers. We didn't want to have to break up, we didn't want to have to move data around, we wanted to keep data in our cloud. Um, we were working with a lot of PII data, we were working with a lot of B2B data, and so there's lots of reasons we wanted to have really tight control over that. And the last part is speed to market. Um, we've historically had an embedded analytics technology we replaced as part of this, and we did that for lots of reasons. We'll probably talk about those a little bit without naming them, but we wanted something faster. We wanted quick prototyping. We wanted the ability to roll things out in you know, literally minutes and hours, not days, weeks, months. Okay, Neil. Great. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about what Sigma is because I think a lot of people are not familiar. Who knows Sigma? All right, Mitch, thank you. Um, so one of the things when I meet, when I've been doing the booth downstairs, and if you have questions, you want to see a demo of Sigma, we have a booth downstairs, booth 91. So go downstairs, talk to our SEs, we can show you how Sigma works, but I want to give you a brief overview. So one thing when people come to the booth, I say, you, you've made this investment in Databricks, you put all this data in there, how are you making that data available to your end users? What are you putting on top? And a lot of times we hear some of the traditional BI tools like Tableau, Power BI. Sigma is in that space, but I always say that we're quicker and we're better and we're easier. Right, so it's a tool that your business users can access all of that data. I am typically dealing with clients who have hundreds of millions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions of rows of data in their data warehouse, and they want fast performance so their end users can access that data and answer vital business questions. So my background is I used to work in the office of finance at Viacom, and so we had a BI tool, and all the time what happened is we'd see a chart and somebody would say that number's wrong and they want to get down to the detail level. So what we used to have to do is write SQL queries, pull all that data out, get into an Excel spreadsheet. I lived in Excel. We had so many Excel spreadsheets, we started running out of server space. So I've been with Sigma for about four years now. I haven't used Sigma, or I have not used Excel in four years. All that stuff that I used to do in Excel, I'm doing in Sigma now. So Sigma is a live cloud exploration. Your data stays in your cloud data warehouse. We are not doing extracts. We are militant about not storing your data. Everything you're gonna do, we're gonna send optimized queries down to your data warehouse, bring that back, present it to the user. So we have interactive intelligence. Um, I would love to talk about input tables. I think input tables are game changing. A lot of times you have data that maybe isn't in your data warehouse. You need to augment your existing data sets. How do you do that? We have input tables, which is essentially a blank table where you can copy and paste load a CSV in, or actually just type values into a table and then connect that to your existing data. And it allows you to augment it. One of the use cases I love is 
a client um, basically does territory realignment. They don't want to put all that up in Salesforce, so they do that. They can add all those values in an input table, join it up to their data, say, yep, that's good, and then they push it up into Salesforce, and they do that through input tables. It really is a game-changing feature for Sigma. The closed-loop execution, and I ran into this a lot with these traditional BI tools. You're looking at uh, a dashboard, your number looks weird, what do you do next? How do you answer that question? A lot of times that was the last stop you went. You go and you fire off a question or an email to somebody to help you figure out what the answer is. Within Sigma, you don't have to do that. You can get access to all that, the most granular level of detail in your data and answer those questions on your own. Augmented intelligence, we are working with AI tools and bringing that in to help the end user. So things like if they're creating a formula, you create a formula in Sigma, similar to how you would do in Excel, so we're gonna help you with that formula. We're gonna help you build your workbooks and we're gonna help even if you have data that's not super clean, we can use AI to clean that up. Um, one of the things I do a lot is work with our clients around data security. Um, we have a lot of banks, a lot of financial services companies. They're super worried about data security and I spend a lot of time working with them. How do we make sure the right people are getting in? How do we make sure they're seeing the data that they're supposed to see? Um, so we have a lot of features around scale and around security uh, for our clients. And then embedded analytics, this is another thing I work with a lot of our clients. We can bring that Sigma experience to an embed portal. So you may want to put some content out on a, an embed page for people to interact with, but we're just showing them some charts, we're just showing them some data, and maybe we're going to have some filters in there that they can interact with that with. We can do that, but we can also go all the way to the other end where we can have people create their own content in an embed portal, save that out, so the next time they come in, they look at the content that they built, that they edited, um, and that's available for them through an embed portal. So again, if you have any questions, you want more detail on any of this stuff, please go visit our booth down, uh, across the street and downstairs. Thank you. All right. Okay, so now we're gonna jump into our um, kind of story and what we've done with Databricks, and then most recently, Sigma. I'm also gonna show a little demo of uh, some of the recent things that we've been rolling out. And so, let's start with the Databricks part. And some of this was a little bit before me, and then I kind of inherited it. So, our company, again, I mentioned in the beginning, we've been around 14 years. So we have built all of our own modeling and data processing capabilities in the early part of the history of the company because a lot of things like Databricks didn't exist. So in the 2020, 21 timeframe, uh, we decided it was time to uh, bring in a commercial solution. And that's when I kind of showed up. And the reason for that is that we were focusing too much time building things that we shouldn't be building. So. Uh, we looked at a couple of options. To us, Databricks ended up being a real obvious solution, and we moved to that in essentially the 2022 timeframe. And what happened was all the processing and kind of homegrown apps that we built, which were mostly a Java and a traditional um, you know, client-server data-based solution, were migrated. So we had to rethink our architecture how we wanted to store the data, leverage the, the lake house architecture that Databricks has. And I just mentioned all this because I know a lot of people go through this, and so it's not like you know, when you're standing up here, it was all roses and you know, parades and, and, and great. Uh, there were some hard you know, things that we had to go through in that process. But you know, getting there was absolutely worth it. And the one example I tell, like when we got to last year and Q1 was like our first quarter where like everything had been migrated. All of our customers were off the old architecture. Everything new was being done in, in Databricks. And so an example, uh, model development that we used to do, which was in the old architecture, uh, we would run a model, they're fairly big. So you know, it might take several days uh, to run a model through training, testing, and know that you've got a valid model and be able to publish it. It might take longer, it just depends you know, on the data set. Uh, because of that homegrown architecture, the way it was built, we could run one or two models at a time through production. And so that really limited our ability to support customers. So at that time, we had about 20% of our customers with a, with a model. And a lot of it was because we were constrained at what we could do for model development, uh, updating models, pushing out new models. In the new Databricks infrastructure, uh, we can run a model in two to four hours and we can run any number of models in parallel at a time, whereas before we could run, run one or two. And the context for that is that's how we went from 20% of our customers with model to 80. Like that's like game changing for our business from that standpoint. 
Uh, and so that's a big part of when we talk about the whole amount of what you can do with Databricks by separating a lot of your data storage uh, from compute is you can start to rethink how you architect your solutions to take advantage of those. Um, that has set us up for now some of the things we're doing with, with Sigma. So we had a, another embedded analytics solution that was more like a classic um, client server model. In fact, you had like a server you had to do certain things on if the data sets were too big to do deployments. And so we were looking for something that was cloud native. We were looking for something that preferably could run in our uh, cloud data warehouse and not require any egress of data. And I wanted something that was a lot like what I appreciate in Databricks, which is it's flexible, you can code any way you want. And what we really wanted was the ability for our front end technical staff who might be sort of like somewhat SQL literate, but not coders, uh, to be able to work with our, our technical team. And so when we look at Sigma, um, it supported all those things uh, to, to what we needed. And then I think the most important part, we want an embedded solution uh, because we have our own tool set that we uh, provide to people that they can run. And then we also embed our analytics into other native applications, CRM systems and map systems. So uh, I'm gonna demo just the Sigma interface today because I, I can't really show you like our customer's actual real stuff. But it, it shows you the same kind of use cases that, that we're doing for our customers. So we started meeting with Sigma late Q4 uh, and basically did the deal in about eight weeks. We went live, I think it was actually February 29th, even though this says March 2024, but I think we went to the 28th or 29th, whatever the end of February was this year. And we were up with phase one in six weeks. And I'll highlight some of those uh, things in the demo. But what we tackled was that first use case I mentioned. We wanted to enable our internal users to work with our large data at scale and not have to go into Databricks because they're not coders. They don't know Python. If they know SQL, you know, they took a class in college maybe. Uh, so that's where I say they're SQL literate. So we wanted them to be able to live the dream, as I put it, of big data. So use case one was this replacement of existing analytics features and a new data exploration application. And so the way our data works is, when we talked about all those signals, so any given, we have data coming in daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly from about 30 vendors. So we're aggregating all that data into Databricks. We're normalizing it into certain uh, data, which is company data, person data, I mentioned intent, then we also have the tech, tech signals and then the custom models around propensity of purchase that we build. So all of that is sort of a, a working train that ships daily, weekly, you know, monthly. And the vision was that instead of that all being in Databricks and then going in a custom app, now Sigma sits there in the middle and everything that we were doing in the custom app, you could now do in Sigma. Uh, this is just a peek at what the architecture looks like from how we work. And so I, it's a little bit of eyeball chart, but there's a lot going on. So we are that lead space CDP platform. And that little box that says third party data, all that stuff I talked about, the few billion data signals, they, they fit in that little box, I know. But, and then what we do is push data to these different channels. And the way to think about it is, we're gonna focus on the demo on these two green ones, that's why they're there but we push data into digital activation marketing systems, into demand gen systems, CRM, and then this would be where we have our own analytics capability or we push into a third party. So what was missing from that is if you were like an internal user, the way to work with that data was in Databricks or you had to go into a third party real application. What we were able to do in our own app was really limited and it was mostly you could see what would be the metadata so it would be, hey, I need a package. Give me this data, this data, this data, and then we let you export it into some other tool. Well, that's not really living the dream. So we really wanted to be able to have our own environment to support that. So um, actually, let's do the, let's switch to the demo first, and then we'll come back to outcomes and stuff. And this is a simple app I built to highlight a couple things, and it's really simple, so I wanna explain what we're seeing here. Because what's interesting is there's three different data sets being aggregated by this web app. And they're all here for a different part. So this top part 
represents what it would be a propensity to purchase model. And so what we do when we build these is we take generally two, three years of sales data from a company, and it's a real simple concept. Who you sell to historically tends to tell us who might buy from you in the future. So it's a lookalike model is a simple way to think about it. But what we do is crunch about 30,000 different data signals to come up with, well, what are the positive and negative influences on that? So this little box represents all of that that happened. And the way to think about it is that A segment is your most likely good customer. And the reason that matters is we start to, to bubble together really simple metrics. So this, this A segment, if we go over here, it represents about 5% of your total opportunities. So what does that mean? Like a typical enterprise company we work with, they might have millions of leads a year. So a lot of what we're doing is helping them find the most likely people that they should spend time on, and that's the way to think about it. So for this, that 5% of their total opportunities and leads represented 22% of their total revenue. And these deals converted at 20% versus an average deal that is lower scored might be 2%. So you start to think about this is how data tells a story. This is how we can start to put data together for you know, regular people to use. Now, this data comes from a Databricks table that we have re-architected that holds all of our model data now. So what's exciting about that is before we were using Databricks with Sigma, we had individual, essentially notebooks that would get created for every model. So for us, that's you know, dozens and hundreds of notebooks that need to be maintained. Now what we've done is there's a single table that holds all the models. It also allows us then to have that be a historical so we can start to do time-based comparisons across those. And with Sigma, what we can do is we can deliver the right view to you using the different security features instead of having like individual reports that are getting generated. So there's a lot of benefits for our team. There's a lot of automation that can be done around that. Now the next part that is interesting is if we come down to, to these tables, so the sample companies. So I talked about, I don't know if anybody remember, there's a number, like how many companies that we have in our data set. So this table, even though it's nice and cute, that's calling the, the master company table that we have with over 200 million companies. So what we've done is we've joined the model data, and instead of having to publish the company data with it, where it might get old, it might get stale, we're calling the real-time company data based on how we're filtering. And so that may sound small, but if you're a data geek and you, know, like you deal with this, it's like, hey, this is exciting. You know, this is what I get excited about. And then the rest of this is filter controls, where what we're trying to do is, again, tell a story. So now if I come in, and maybe what I want to do is, um, right now we've got multiple models loaded, so we're looking across these. So let's say we just pick a single model and we're gonna pull this one. So now what we're seeing is all of our calculations are changing in real time. So we've got different average deal sizes, we've got different scores because we picked a model for, uh, and I've anonymized all this, so these are like actual customer data that we're not talking about. But like in this case, it's a average deal size, 1.7 million if they're in an A. It's got a 2.75, uh, increase of, of closing in that type of customer. And then, you know, it's, it's just making it so this is really easy. So maybe I want to come in and I only want to know, uh, let's see, hopefully there's data there, Southeast Asia. So and then, you know, we can come in and again, we're making this for a business user. They're like scrolling over millions of records and they don't know it. That's self-service apps. So. And I built this in, because I've gotten better. I couldn't have done this six months ago or six weeks ago. This was 60 minutes of work for me to put this together. So, and then I probably could have done it quicker, but it didn't. So, um, but that's the type of apps we want to build and we want to do more things like that. So, project outcomes. Um, we have delivered phase one, and phase one is all internal. And so it's applications like that that our internal users can use. In phase two, we're getting ready to do, and it's probably we're two to four weeks, so I would say July, we're gonna to start to roll these out to our customers, and that will replace the kind of out, outdated version we had. 
And the thing about that too is it wasn't as interactive as, as what I was showing. It wasn't always linked to all the, the active data that we have. And so it's a much more up-to-date, much more uh, experience-driven uh, type of uh, solution. Um, let's see what else we want to talk about here. I'll, I'll re-hit the points I said before. So the data egress is a big deal. Um, having Sigma be able to run, we use Google, and we also run in Amazon, those are our two instances. So, but having uh, the ability to run this solution in our warehouse and not have any egress to support it is a really big deal. Uh, I'm showing all the Sigma interfaces in that demo. We're actually doing more of a hybrid solution in our application where what we're gonna do is embed certain Sigma uh, UI capabilities. In other cases, we're gonna work directly with the APIs because uh, their APIs support all the same features and functions in terms of data. So that gives us a lot of customization we can do with our web apps. That was really uh, important to us. Um, and then we're moving on to the next phase, which, which I'll uh, go over as part of this. So, so phase one architecture, uh, primarily for internal, we wanted the same live data connection that you experience in Databricks. So what we've done is built a, you know, Sigma is just a data platform on top of Databricks. It's a visualization and um, a processing engine, but it really is more about putting the, the data to work for the business. Uh, whereas for us anyway, Databricks has primarily been more about, again, integrating, normalizing, um, and we use it for our model data also. So it's pretty straightforward from that standpoint, live data, secure data, all in one place. What we're getting ready to do as part of the next phase, that's kind of covered up a little bit, but we are going to be doing uh, one or both of these, depending on how the use cases work out, but we need to tackle our low latency use cases. So not every use case is live query. A lot of our customers what we're doing for them, they don't need to query. It's a, it's a preset experience, and, or they don't need to change the structure of the data is probably a better way to put it. They're querying, but we know what the queries are. So we are going to be using uh, some combination of, of Google BigQuery, because we're a Google shop, for some of these, and then we're experimenting with the uh, vector search and, and serverless technologies. So if anybody has experience with that, I'd love to talk to you. Um, because we do have the ability where we need to do um, what I always say, five seconds or less, even if nobody cares if you're crunching 200 million records in a query, they don't wanna wait. So whereas our, our employees might wait a few seconds because it saved them going to Databricks and you know, doing other stuff, uh, our customers aren't. So there's definitely some of the things that we're doing now, we're gonna replicate out. And that'll be a big part of phase two in terms of things that we're doing. Uh, some things to share, and then uh, we're gonna have time for a few questions too. I think, um, not on here, but I, I'll repeat some of the things I shared at the beginning. It's a journey, so I think that if you are, like in my case, I was the person that you know pushed this, was a decision maker, I run the team. Uh, you gotta get your team on board, and then you gotta understand that not everybody, even when they says, say they're on board, is on board, if it's all new technology and a new approach. So you really, I think, have to focus on the benefits to the customer, the benefits to whether that's your internal customers or your external customers. And that is what has really, I think, changed some of our naysayers. We had, um, as much as I've ever seen launching a solution, we had internal stakeholders. My, my CEO was texting me, telling me how freaked out and excited in a good way she was when we launched the first report internally. Like that's the kind of you know, thing that, that you wanna see. So it's do the basics, do them well, get them out fast, and then keep iterating. Um, goes without saying performance and security. Um, I think for us in phase one, it's straightforward, it's all internal. Phase two is a lot of the role-based access that uh, we can do that's just built in. And then we're back to the customer uh, centricity. Uh, it's gotta start. Start there, in there, and then keep talking to your customers about what they're trying to do. Um, I think for us, again, it's every single, if I, well, there's two things. It's same, same thing, but the answer's different. If I talk to the data people at my customers, what they'll say is, how can you enable me to help my business people better so they don't bug me, quite frankly. That's, it's something like that, right? On the business side, they're like, how can you make me self-sufficient? 
And they're asking for the same thing. They want to work better together, and they don't want to have to like deal with things that, that just don't make sense and are a waste of time. So for us, it's how do we enable that, that collaborative environment between our um, customers who have data teams we work with a lot, but at the end of the day, they want to make their business people successful and excited. Okay, so said some of this, but we'll repeat it. So phase two is all about low latency and then rolling out new capabilities. Uh, there's a lot that we're gonna do there. And then it, it is a lot of the, the AI things. In fact, I've, I've seen things the last couple of days here that uh, make me think we're probably behind on, on some of that than, than we thought we were. But what we wanna do is start to incorporate um, more low latency, and then the way we see AI being part of this is, today, um, people need to basically talk to us sometimes and interpret the model. They shouldn't have to do that. Like, they should be able to talk to the model, is, is the way that I put it to our development team. So there's all these insights that are built into our data that we should have be uh, discoverable. You should be able to work with a natural language, uh, search and or generative AI to work with those. Uh, and that's really where we're going next, and both Databricks and Sigma are gonna be part of that. Okay, so we've got, according to the clock, eight minutes, so if there's any questions. Uh, if you don't wanna ask questions in the larger group, I'm happy to answer anything afterwards. So I wanna thank everybody for coming, and if there's questions, I'll take them, or Neil will take them. Yep. And please visit our booth downstairs, across the street.